Um, can I have an adoption of the agenda? Moved, Darlene, thank you very much. Um, today we'll receive a briefing on the economic impact of the suspension on, the, of, on trade of fresh Prince Edward Island potatoes to the United States and appearing uh, with us today we have uh, from the Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, Director of Workforce Development, Mary Hunter. Thank you for being with us today. Um, and as part of the committee today appearing virtually, we have uh, Peter Bevan Baker, Hannah Bell and Ola Hammerland. Um, can I get a, an adoption? Oh, we already did an adoption of the agenda. Um, so I guess with that, we'll jump right into our presentation. Um, Mary, we'll turn the uh, floor over to you and we'll just hold our questions until the end. Mary? Oh, sorry. Are we Chair? Sorry, Hannah, could you not hear hear me? Well, we can't hear you. Your mic is off. Okay. Maybe we'll do this all over again. Okay. <laughs> okay, so sorry about that. I guess my mic wasn't on. Um, is it, am I? Yeah, everyone can hear me now, can you? Okay, perfect. All right, so we'll, we'll do an adoption. An adoption of the agenda again. So Darlene uh, moved that, so that's great. Thank you. Um, and I had introduced Mary, but I, I guess not everyone could hear me. So um, from the Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, uh, Director of Work Workforce Development, we have Mary Hunter with us today to have a pres give us a presentation and answer our questions. Um, so with that, I'll turn the floor over to you, Mary, and you can. Uh, we'll hold our questions until the end. Perfect. Great. I'm just going to share my screen. And does everyone see the screen, the presentation on the screen? No, not yet. Well, that's concerning, just one second. Apologize for my technical difficulties here. Just take a quick recess and we'll try and uh, sort out your issue, Mary. Okay, we're, uh, we're back now, and it looks like your presentation's working, Mary, so um, whenever you're ready to start, we can go ahead. Perfect. Thank you for that, and I apologize for my technical difficulties this morning. 
Um, thank you for inviting me to the standing committee. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to walk through the presentation with the impact specifically to the workforce and certainly feel free to stop and ask me any questions as we, uh, as we go through the presentation today. Still seeing it okay? Yes. Perfect. So what we know, and I know you've spent um, a significant amount of time hearing from individuals who have been speaking about the temporary ban of potatoes going into the U.S. So what we certainly know is in 2020, there was over $106 million of exports going into the U.S. of island potatoes. 2020, um, 2021 had been a strong growing season, estimated at 28 and a half hundred weight of potatoes, which was up from the year before, which was a drought year. The potato industry contributes about 1.3 billion to the PEI economy and employs approximately 5,000 Islanders, which would be both direct and indirect. And I think, you know, for me, who wouldn't be uh, certainly an agriculture specialist, but watching this from the workforce, our province um, is currently has international potato exports of 23 percent of the Canadian total. So it just demonstrates the significance and the impact in our province. In December, uh, December 10th. 2020, our department had announced a number of initiatives to support um, primarily packing companies and producers of table stock potatoes, as well as um, trucking companies who were moving product into the U.S. The support really is to assist with the wage uh, reduction and to ensure that Islanders working within those sectors were not um, laid off due to shortage of work. We were all extremely hopeful as we are today that the border would resume and that product would continue to move. And we wanted to ensure that those companies were able to maintain their staff for that period of time. The budget approval for this program in early December was $4 million. And that was based on a forecast of up to 1,400 employees. And just to speak to how we were able to come to those projections, I think from November 21st until um, early December, our staff did outreach with the packing companies and producers across the province to talk about the impacts, to find out how many staff they had working through November prior to the ban to develop the forecast into the month of December. To date, in January, our, our program has been extended. Unfortunately, with the closure still impacted, we have extended the program. To date, we've received applications. We're supporting uh, 43 producers and, and four of the trucking companies. Approximately um, 700 employees to date that we've, we've been assessing their applications on. And it just demonstrates, um, you know, the, the significance that this has had in our workforce. The companies, you know, some of our packing companies still do have domestic markets. So there's an adjustment made to the program. If they are able to um, ship potatoes domestically, then there's a reduction made to their claim. So each of the producers do have to make a, a deduction on their domestic um, hours of work versus what traditionally was being moved into the U.S. market. Early in December, we very quickly were engaging our counterparts at Employment Social Development Canada. Um, we had sent a ministerial letter. Our minister had sent to his counterpart at ESDC on December the 10th. We've had a significant volume of calls back and forth. Um, the, uh, in 2020, we had gone through this process before and Shockingly, I was involved in 2020 when, when the potato war um, situation had happened at that point in time. We were very hopeful that we would receive a federal contribution in order to support the industry in that province. Unfortunately, we haven't received that support and we're using provincial funds in order to implement our program. We continue to go back and forth with engagement on officials in Ottawa, talking about programs that could support longer term and there is a work sharing program it does have a reduction of income which is a concern for us in this sector however we are continuing to explore that program with our federal counterparts in the province 
the um, we do have a discussion with them ongoing with respect to the longer this ban continues, the impacts are devastating with respect to not only agriculture in the potato sector, the trucking sector, our manufacturing companies. We're hearing now from rural communities on retail, on restaurants, um, you know, that traditionally would benefit from having, you know, the 1,400 individuals uh, working long term in, in the plants and the uh, and the packing companies. So I think the the impacts are much broader than the potato sector alone. We have been working very closely with the PEI Agriculture um, Sector Council, and I, I do want to acknowledge, you know, Lori Lone, the Potato Board, with with uh, Greg Donald's staff. Um, we've been engaging from with them very quickly when the ban closed, and we were trying to identify if there was any opportunities on increasing training to support employers with their staff. And I do um, certainly need to acknowledge the work that they've done to be able to submit proposals. We, um, we are now operating, uh, the Agriculture Sector Council is administering a program to, for class 3A truck driving. Uh, this has been in the news as of late, last spring, summer, fall, the shortage of truck drivers and the impact that that was having in the agriculture sector. They're also administering a program called Ag Trag train the trainer and our uh, agriculture sector council in our province did receive a national award from the Canadian Society of Safety Engineers for the train the trainer certificate program. So it really focuses on farm safety, WMIS, OHS committee effectiveness to try to really support the operators and their staff with, with the training. And then we have forklift operator training that's happening. So, um, you know, to have this initiative um, pulled together through the months of December and January with, with the circuit breaker and the other elements that are happening, I, I really need to acknowledge the work that's happened by both the industry and the Ag Sector Council to be able to support in this type of initiative. So next steps, where do we go from here? I think, you know, ongoing engagement on a daily, weekly basis. We're talking with um, producers, with potato board with the Ag Sector Council on what can we do. I certainly, um, you know, feel for the producers and the packing companies and staff just not knowing what tomorrow brings. I think everyone is hoping that the border opens. We'll continue to do outreach and, and really try to pivot and make adjustments to our programs to ensure they're responsive. No one wants to administer programs that are not meeting the needs of Islanders. And I do want to really reiterate the importance of that engagement and the benefit that we see when we administer programs. And we're monitoring the impacts on all of the sectors. So the first Friday of every month, those of you that love data would see that Stats Canada releases our workforce data. We track very closely month to month, year over year, the impacts of the different sectors. The pandemic and circuit breakers does is going to impact what our December uh, numbers look like. Um, but those are some of the key indicators that we will be watching very closely and making any modifications required as we continue to engage going forward. So that um, is the presentation. I think, Mr. Chair, I'll take questions. Okay, perfect. Um, first on my list, I have Rob. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Mayor. Appreciate uh, the presentation there. You mentioned the, the 4.2 million that was uh, allowed for uh, wage subsidies for employers. That about 700 uh, uh, have utilized that. Is that am I getting that right? It, it would be 700 employees impacted. So we have 43 potato companies, Mr. Henderson, who would be participating, and that would be applications that have received. We certainly have um, six to eight other companies who are engaging with our staff and are working on an application. But what we've given you for the data is what we have currently in-house that we're processing. Uh Rob, do you have any sense of why the other, that you really got about half of them uh, 
uh, tapping into the particular program. So I guess my, my ultimate question is ultimately heading in here is that you've got 4.2 million, so that we'll assume that you're spending half of that. Are you going to uh, revamp the program to, uh, to include more people, or is, what, what, what do you do to get that money out and, and leveraged out into the community? I think, you know, unfortunately, some of the producers have laid off staff. So, you know, we do have some layoffs that have happened in the sector in December. And if they did um, issue a layoff, then those individuals were not eligible to um, to participate in the program. So I do think, you know, the we've had some companies who their project projections on what they were going to be able to move domestically changed throughout that month as well. So not everyone is receiving um, the maximum amount per employee, which is $3,000 over that period of time. So it's based on a $700 estimate that we did each week. And the producers are making an adjustment based on, on that. I do think, you know, we, we, this past week, we've been doing outreach with other producers to try to learn why they haven't applied. Um, and unfortunately, I think with the pandemic and the potato temporary ban, we, we have experienced more layoffs in the sector than what we were hoping to see. Rob? Yeah, from uh, some of the processors that I talk to in my area, it just, they just have nothing to do. I, I mean, that's part of the problem. I believe the subsidy is, uh, what's it, a 50% wage subsidy? So it's, if you have really not enough to do, I mean, I think some have kept a few people around to do a little bit of maintenance, but uh, so, and, and it's just simply because they just have no markets to move uh, product to. And I think it's mostly in the seed sector where everything is really on hold on that. And although they may not do a bit more until later, uh, there are still big concerns that they will have nothing for them to do, and the only activity might be to, to dump product. But, but I guess I'm just looking at if you haven't spent the money, is there ways that uh, the industry can come up with other solutions to try to lever that money so you can either increase the wage subsidy to make it a bit more enticing? Is that some of the type of things that your department would be looking at? So two pieces to that question. I think the first one that I want to address, and, and many of you probably did see the national news coverage with a company that was in, I believe, in your riding, Mr. Henderson, on, um, you know, there was, there was an impact where they did have time available and they helped us with test kits. So they broke apart test kits for the pandemic and did deliveries in all of the schools in Prince County. So I think, you know, you're right, employers, there's an implication of having staff in and not having work available, which is a concern. So I think we've been helping them as well. They've been helping the province in other types of activities, but that is you know, a concern. And I think that has led to certainly more people being laid off than what we were anticipating. As far as your budget um, question, absolutely. I can tell you this week that we've been engaging. We're working on um, tweaks to be able to support broader implications within the sector and those will be going forward um, very quickly on you know what other areas can we help um, you know when you look at the timing from this from December 10th until today I think you know there's been many pivots that we have to make and some unintended kind of you know with unintended consequences with where we are in the pandemic as well. Um, so $4 million budget, we will absolutely make sure the engagement continues and we'll be looking at any sort of modifications that can help to keep Islanders employed as long as possible. Rob? Yeah, thanks, Barry. You know, and I've worked with you in lots of capacities uh, before politics and, and afterwards uh, regarding some of the training components. And I think maybe that's a, a direction that, so if the employer doesn't have work, is there ways that we can implement the training? You did mention you were working a bit with the Agriculture Sector Council, and uh, that's, uh, you know, there, there may be some opportunities there. Now, I have seen a few courses uh, that uh, some of the companies are offering, like uh, truck driving and forklift and some of those things, but they don't seem to be able to get enough numbers to make them happen or, or whatever. So I'm just wondering, is there something that can be done to uh, train people in their place of work while they're not working where they can kind of come in and get those skill upgrades? And, it, and that could range like I say, it could be literacy training, GED upgrading, it could be uh, uh, more skilled uh, 
types of uh, uh, training that they could get to uh, make them more uh, adaptable to that particular farm, because we do d generally tend to have uh, labor shortages in the agricultural sector, uh, and it does tend to be in, in the, uh, some of the technologies that are out there. So I'm just wondering if something can be done there that could uh, either pay for the, the, uh, the training at 100%, give them an allowance while they're going, or something along that line that could really make a difference. And uh, I guess I did, I did want to correct you, mentioned that uh, that employer that did the, uh, the packaging of uh, the test kits, that, not in my district, but you're in the region anyway, but uh, I guess it's a neighboring MLA a little farther west that uh, got that <laughs> to be done. But anyway, just to clarify that. But anyway, maybe I can get a little bit of a sense of where you're heading in the training side of it. So I go back to, I think it was mid-November, I was at the farm centre with, with industry talking to a group in both agriculture and trucking on truck and transport and, and the agriculture um, heavy equipment tech program. And, and a couple of things. First of all, that program is operating in Prince Edward Island for the first time. Um, second, it's one of our apprenticeship programs that's operating and, and did continue through the pandemic. So two weeks ago, we have a class of um, Islanders who are participating in training in, in both sectors, truck and transport, heavy duty equipment, which is really needed, and the ag equipment piece. So, you know, that was developed in collaboration with the trucking sector and the agriculture sector council, Mr. Henderson, on, on getting that program going. So we're happy that one started in January. It's operating. We actually have to have a second cohort going because the demand is so high. And I do remember in November telling them about the opportunities in the sector and, and how it's a great career to be in that field. Um, you know, the, the class three and the forklift operator training and, and when the councils came forward in December, um, we did make a policy adjustment that was approved in our department to support the ag agriculture sector council right now with 100% support. So you're right, we were targeting individuals who were working in the potato sector to do class three, to do uh, forklift training, to do WMIS, to do first aid. The time piece, and I want to talk about that um, quickly, is, you know, in many of those training fields, they do require medicals, they do require uh, vulnerable record checks. So there's some other elements that individuals have to have before they can take training. So, you know, we're looking at additional training elements um, and taking down any barriers that would be there. Um, you know, for our class 3A, highway safety, for example, has come um, to partner with us in the Ag Sector Council. So they're now sending their testers out to the regions to be able to do the testing so that we can try to move through quicker in January and February with training opportunities. But we, we, have, we, have, we welcome the opportunity to do training and, and we will continue to do that with, with industry. I hope that answers your question, and sorry about the the, the boundary lines of, of the writing. No problem. Uh, Hannah Bell? Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Mary. It's nice to see you today. Thanks for coming in. Um, just, I just wanted to do a couple of clarification questions, just because I know there's a ton of different um, numbers flying around. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you had mentioned that um, and, you know, a number of employees have been laid off, and laid off employees are obviously not eligible for the wage subsidy program. What supports are they eligible for? I guess, because I know there have been some challenges with, with, for instance, with the EI eligibility because of some of the COVID programs and so on. So there's a lot of concern that the employees that were laid off maybe are, are not getting support that they may need. Could you just speak to that? Sure. So that, you know, Obviously, our target was to try to avoid as many layoffs as possible, but that, um, you know, did happen. I think what the support that we've provided, Ms. Bell, is reaching out to the companies to ensure that when records of employment was issued and individuals were applying, that we tried to minimize the time delay in that process. So we've been doing follow-up to make sure that, you know, they've been able to receive benefits. The supports that they would receive right now would be employment insurance, which would be 55% of their salary. And um, they, you know, they would be eligible for our um, 
COVID relief program right now. So the $500 um, program for implications after December 17th layoffs. So we would be working with them on that program as well. So, you know, the layoff is based on employment insurance eligibility. You are correct. There is a time um, delay that we have been experiencing in our province through December and January, just with the sheer volume of people applying for federal COVID supports. Hannah? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and, and obviously that's what, you know, we're hearing that in the communities that, you know, that are that are impacted and across the, 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 the you know, people understand the reason, but it's still the actual impact of that is significant. Though the $500 bridging piece has, has absolutely helped. Um, are people who were laid off eligible for any of the training programs that you spoke about? They are the target market for, for training. Right. So individuals who have been laid off as well as individuals who are employed that have had a um, reduction in hours or an industry impact. So, you know, the, the one element would be we are seeing some of the individuals laid off who are now participating in training, yes. Yeah. Hannah? Thank you, Chair. And you'd mentioned, you know, um, that, that despite the negotiations with uh, ESDC, that, that there isn't any um, federal funds um, committed at the moment to, to this. So this is being entirely funded with the provincial contribution of $4 million. Um, and that's providing that subsidy. Is that the reason why the subsidy is at 50%? Um, you know, to my colleague's point, if there, if there literally just isn't work, but we're trying to keep people employed, say, for instance, there's only 25% work. If that money is provincially allocated, then the province gets to decide what the parameters are around that allocation. So is there a reason why we're sticking with 50% when there could be some flexibility there in the short term? Thank you for the question. And I did, um, I did mean to go back when Mr. Henderson had asked that the support is actually up to 100%. So it isn't a 50% cap. Our our traditional programs do run cost sharing with employers, but with this one, um, it is up to 100% support. The adjustment gets made through the claim process if there is other work that is being done outside of the US potato ban. So we do provide up to 100% of the wage reimbursement to a maximum of the $700 per week just for employees. Okay. Hannah? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mary, for that clarification. That was my, my concern was I know that there are some very specific limitations put around those subsidies when there is a federal contribution, but when it's only provincial, it makes sense that we could have some flexibility to re reflect what's happening in the market. Um, uh, and do we have, and that, that money is paid to the employer who then play, pays that to the employee. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Chair? Anna? Thank you. Um, so how how much longer will that fund last without there being either an additional contribution required or um, the federal government required to step in? Like what what's the kind of time frame that we're looking at before you have to start negotiating heavily <laughs> or, or more so than we are already, I'm sure. So I, I think, you know, with Employment Social Development Canada, so our federal counterparts at ESDC, you know, they do provide a significant transfer to the province for our programs that we administer at Skills PEI. I think you, you've unpackaged some of the challenges, um, Ms. Bell, that we face is being able to be nimble and responsive usually takes a longer window. So we would do that on a quarterly, semi-annual semi basis to be able to modify programs. And, and we, we just, to make that adjustment this quickly has, has been difficult. I think that's what we're assessing right now with our federal colleagues is, you know, we need the flexibility. We were all hoping that December we were going to be through and the border was going to open. And much like all of us on this call, January, we were still hopeful. You're right. Every month that goes by, we do um, see that pressure on the budget piece. Um, so I think, you know, we've been raising this federally. We have weekly engagement with them on, you know, how what modifications can we make to support this sector? And, and that will continue, um, you know, 
there, there has been discussions. Uh, they would like to see us use a program called work sharing. Um, we're exploring that. However, it is still a, a reduction in, in income for Islanders, which, you know, that's not the ideal scenario for us right now in January in Prince Edward Island. So we're, we're, we are assessing, I can tell you, we have a team of officials that uh, have been um, spending tremendous amount of time back and forth trying to figure out different opportunities for that, so. Hannah? Thanks, Joe. if I could just ask one more question and then sure. pass it over. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that, Mary, because you know, I'm doing, doing a bit of quick math and, and you know, we're, this is, you're out of money this, like this month that, you know, it, it's 700, up to 700 a week, 700 employees is, is, it's going to be done. So, um, you know, I, I, either that means the province is going to need to sort of make step up with some additional funds, or we are going to need to reallocate, um, as you said, through negotiation funds that are coming in from, from ESDC. I also, um, I, am, I am also concerned about the work share approach, um, given that these are primarily um, jobs that are in our rural communities where these these were the best jobs and and you know that there's not like an excess of other roles there are only there are only so many truck drivers we can train compared to the 1400 employees that we're talking about being impacted so you know I recognize that this is a short-term solution to keep people you know housed and fed and, and so on but but when do we start talking about longer term, um, in terms of the sector itself, because you know, obviously, our concern is is people are going to leave that sector if we if we aren't able to sort of maintain and support an adequate living wage there. Great question. And just to speak about the four million dollar fund, and I had alluded to adjustments being made with employers if they have been able to send domestic markets. So we have, you know. If there, if there is some positive element, we do have some of our packing companies who are still moving product across Canada, mm. which means that there is a, a, de, a deducted amount. So I, I think what I can tell you is every week, our department and the Department of Agriculture are engaging where are we, and, and we're very aware of, you know, uh, where we are on the funding piece. So we haven't met the full commitment and we do have some room to try to make um, make some proposed adjustments. I think, you know, the one element is our program focuses on the table and the fresh market right now. We know there are implications on seed. There are implications on other sectors that every month that goes by, the needs get adjusted. So I think, you know, first step for us is hoping the border opens. So then we can get out of uh, where we are today, but every month brings about a different type of engagement with our partners to figure out modifications that we have to make. So I do suffice it to say, I think, you know, we're here, we're committed, we're hopeful, and we'll do what we can to make those adjustments. Hannah, do you, do you have any more? You're good, Hannah? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see what happens with the rest and then come back to the list. Right, Thank you, excellent. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Olaf? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, detail a little bit more what the different classes of uh, employees are affected the most. Uh, like I would imagine it's, it's primarily Packers, uh, uh, since uh, truckers, whether they're vaccinated or not, seems to be in short supply everywhere. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. Thank you for that question. I think, um, you know, when when we looked at the program being designed, the packing companies um, do have the biggest number of staff in the sector that were impacted. So um, we would be around 40 companies that would be uh, packers or would be direct shipping table stock into the U.S. And how we went to about that is we work very closely with um, the Potato Board and the Department of Agriculture on which companies were shipping into the U.S. prior to the ban closure. So that would be the bulk, certainly, Mr. Hamberlin, of who would be participating right now would be the packing companies. And, you know, we would be 
we would be assessing, you know, and some of the companies had up to 80 staff um, and it would vary down to some of the uh, farms having six staff. So the bulk of this program is on the potato side, packing companies being, I would say, uh, the highest percentage, followed by farms that were um, begging and shipping table stock into the U.S. The, the trucking sector and the way we've been uh, working with the trucking sector, because you're right, there's a shortage of supply. We're nervous about the supply chain and the impacts as this continues. We do know that at present there's uh, a, a significant amount of potatoes that are here in the province. And we had um, a number of companies that were doing weekly, bi-weekly trips into the U.S., moving the market. So it's a smaller number of trucking companies that would be participating to the potato companies. And the implications are somewhat different based on those two sectors. Ola? Uh, uh, thank you for that uh, answer. I was wondering, I, I understand that you are training people in the uh, industry for potentially other jobs. I was wondering, are you worried about um, if the ban ever gets lifted that you won't have the capacity to get back on the market, so to speak? So, you know, our main business line here at Skills PEI would be training for Islanders um, on all sectors. So, you know, I think it, our training programs will continue. I think the element when you look at it from the Islander who is looking at that training opportunity, if their employment is impacted and their income is impacted and they're not really sure where their, um, their next paycheck is going to come from, it, it does make it difficult to always move directly into training. People have to be ready um, to make that step into training. So it's not going to work for everyone. There are partners that we work with that assess when the appropriate need is and when the, when the applicant is ready. So I think, you know, we aren't concerned with respect to long-term training Islanders. That is a number one goal for the province in increasing um, education and opportunities for residents. I think it's, it's, it's the emotional toll that decisions like this take on our residents. Um, if you're used to going to work every day and you're used to doing a certain job and then it's taken away, that has a toll that makes your journey change on your next decision. So I, I hope I answered your question. It, it is, it's, it's a difficult one based on, on where people are in that journey. Ola? I, uh, thank you. Uh, no, I appreciate uh, your efforts. Uh, I have one last question. Uh, uh, your department in other sectors, like the entertainment and food industry, did a very successful efforts to support the, the sales. Uh, could you tell me to what extent your department is uh, doing anything about sending uh, truckloads of uh, potatoes to... Um, food banks elsewhere in Canada for any efforts in that area? So I do believe though those conversations would be happening with colleagues in the Department of Agriculture. That wouldn't be an area that I would be directly involved in with respect to um, sending product across Canada. I do know I've heard from producers and packing companies who have been involved in that process and trucking companies shipping. So I think, you know, they, they do recognize the efforts that people are taking in order to move product. No one wants to see 300 million pounds of potatoes stay in our province and, and not ship to feed people. But that wouldn't be, I wouldn't be directly involved in those discussions. Thank you, Ola. Uh, next is uh, Minister Compton. 
thank you, Chair. And uh, just on Ola's question there on CBC Radio this morning, Mark Phillips was on from the Potato Board, and they are uh, actively shipping potatoes to a number of food banks across the country, and they're continuing to do that. So it was uh, it was good to hear. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us online. And uh, I just, um, I know you're working hard on trying to um, make sure that uh, people that are uh, intimately involved in the industry are retraining and, and trying to find a, a, a way forward for them. But um, has the department done any um, research on the total impact to islanders and to businesses because it's not just it's not just um, the workers and it's not just the truckers it goes on and on and on and on and um, for the long term um, effect of this you know has has uh, your department done anything as far as looking into uh, what the impact will be for the island Question. Thank you for that. I, I think right now what we're looking at would be directly related to the potato sector, um, but you're right. Every month that goes on that expands into all of the other sectors. I think the, the impact that we're looking at is the contribution that the potato industry makes to to the province, the GDP, and you know what is going to be that long-term impact. It is a it's it's a healthy balance that we make when when we talk about retraining and impact because as sectors have experienced a number of uh, changes within the last year and no sector wants to see their staff retrain and move to another sector um, you know we want to see what's best for island residents but we we try to balance that out and making sure that um, individuals stay within. So the the impact is currently being assessed very closely with the Department of Agriculture, our economic um, statistics folks, as well as as um, statistics bureau within the provincial treasury, and we'll continue to monitor that. First Friday of every month, as you know, Minister Compton, when our, our data comes out on the implications of December to the workforce, we'll be monitoring the ag sector and others very closely to see what those implications were. Darlene. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mary. Um, the, the other question I guess I have is, I think we all feel kind of helpless throughout this process, but uh, for, for uh, especially for the MLAs uh, across the province, is there anything that, that we could do that you feel that we could do that would make a difference um, to, to help change this? Uh, I mean, it is all hands on deck, but you know, we do feel helpless and I think we all do. So I'm just, if you have any, uh, I guess, <laughs> wonderful ideas that would help, yeah. So, I, I, you know, I, I agree. I think um, a couple of things from my perspective. First would be one of the discussions we're having with our federal colleagues. It, you know, we have programs that are developed to deal with mainstream scenarios within the workforce. We need to have flexibility on areas that are outside of our control, that impact the workforce, impact our residents, so that we can make modifications to be responsive and nimble, and that's one of the elements that we've been um, discussing, I think, internally, so that you know it, it still needs to be accountable to, to taxpayers, but we need to be able to pivot quickly would be the first. Um, I think another area would be um, just growing up and, and living in a farming community that the dialogue around the kitchen table would make me really nervous right now about that long-term career path. And we're a food province. So I think continuing to invest to provide information within you know, the school system, within the sector on agriculture is a great career choice. And yes, you know, there, there are times like this, which does put pressure, but I think we really need to to continue to invest so that people will make a choice to stay in this career um, long term. So those would be two that I can think of, um, the responsiveness piece, and, and then continuing to invest in, in education and the awareness. Um, you know, I, the, the new um, social media campaign with the potato sector 
Um, you know, I, I was one that couldn't really fathom how many potatoes were in our province, but I can fathom 25 NHL ranks two stories high filled with potatoes. So I think really the education piece is, is key so that people understand what we're facing in our province. Thank, thank you, Mary. You. Thank you, Mary. Oh, thank you, Darlene. Uh, Hal? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And, uh... Thank you very much, Mary, for this wonderful presentation. I always have confidence in your abilities and know that if you're uh, involved, um, everything possibly that can be done for whoever the stakeholders are, um, they'll be taken care of. So I, I don't, just want to say that. Um, I only really have one question. All the other questions have been asked. And so this 4.2 million that is going into this uh, wage subsidy program, does it affect any of the other programs uh, within Skills PEI, budget-wise? Thank you. Thank you for your question and, and thank you for your kind words. Um, no, I, you know, the provincial initiatives that we, we do administer do not impact our, our budget. So, you know, and, and our existing staff administer the programs uh, and, and would be, I will tell you right now, I, on this initiative, it is our staff and our Western unit that are administering this program. So we'll continue. We have a budget of $36 million um, of federal transfers. We'll continue to administer the programs, both the circuit breaker programs, the industry adjustment type programs like this one for potato exports are in addition to our day-to-day -day, um, business. And I really want to acknowledge the team of staff that I have across the province that um, take this work on and are really committed to the residents that we serve. So it is additional to our work, yes. I'm, I'm uh, good, I'm good, Chair, uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks Mary. Uh, Peter? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mary. Nice to see you. I, I wanna dig down a little bit in the wage subsidy program, which has been sort of focus of most of the discussion today. Um, employers, uh, are the ones who apply for this program. And I'm wondering whether the program itself covers temporary foreign workers who may be currently here on the island employed by, by farms. Thank you for your question. And I'm, I'm not, many of you probably know, I'm the former director of, of immigration. Um, temporary foreign workers are, are, are very important to our economy and to this sector in particular. Um, while we have some of our programs do restrict access to temporary foreign workers, the province was very clear that we wanted to support um, all employees that were impacted. It was a recommendation that came from industry directly and we've been able to respond. It is a criteria that has been a struggle for us with some of our federal provincial agreements on being able to assist um, temporary foreign workers, but for this program, they are eligible. There had, so the way the temporary foreign worker program does work is seasonal agriculture uh, workers that were in our province were contracted to leave December, I think it was the 15th, whatever that Friday was. Um, so many had been already scheduled to leave the um, province and country. So obviously they wouldn't have been impacted, but anyone here for the longer term program would be eligible to support it. Peter? Great, thank you, Mary. A couple of follow-up questions to that. Do you have statistics on how many TFWs are, um, are being covered by this program? And secondly, and this goes back to one of the points Hannah Bell made, that with, in the absence of sort of shared funding uh, through, through the federal government for this wage subsidy program, um, going month to month, if, if all 1,400, you know, you've capped it at 1,400, um, but if all 1,400 employees were to apply, uh, were to be eligible for this $3,000 limit, it, it, we have to spend $4 million every month. So how many TFWs are, are being covered by this? And uh, how, are we going to carry on with this? I understand that every month is, it's a moving target, but are we going to carry on with this program independent of federal support uh, for as long as it takes? So for your 
First question with respect to the the number, I think I, I would like to report back to the committee with the exact breakdown. I can tell you it's something that I have been monitoring month to month and the overall percentage um, of temporary farm workers was much smaller than I had initially anticipated in early December. But I, if that's okay, I'd like to get back to you with the exact number. Um, I, I know just even this week, there was another company who has just recently submitted their application with their information. So for our, our staff need to assess that. So we'll report back on, on the TFWs. The discussion, you know, on where do we go from here, uh, the two department leads and the structure that has been set up within the province between uh, Department of Agriculture and, and Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, which um, is where we're impacted, you know, we're looking at this this week, um, we've been we've been working on making adjustments since the middle of the month when it did look like February was very close by. And um, you know, the one element, uh, my staff administering the program in the Western End have very strong relationships with the producers and the the um, the organizations, so they're aware that we're working on this to make the modifications. I. I can't commit, obviously, to how long funding will stay. I think, you know, it, it is uh, top of mind within our department, and I know we're, 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 we continue to spin to try to figure out ways that we can work collectively with the federal government and make modifications to our program should this continue on into the spring um, in hoping that we get good news any day to open up the border. But, yeah, it... I hope I answered your question and I'll get back to you on the data on the temporary farm workers. Peter? Yeah, thanks, Mary. You, you did. I mean, we're all, of course, hoping that the, the only sort of acceptable, fully acceptable solution to this is for the border to be opened and, and, and we come back to some semblance of normality when it comes to supply chains and being able to get all of these millions of pounds of potatoes out the door. Um, the, the $28 million that the federal government has come forward with um, seem to be specifically for two areas. One is for the food banks, and that's already been discussed, and that program is underway. And the other way that that was going to be paid out was directly to farmers for, uh, if I remember right, the, um, destroying the potatoes in an environmentally friendly way. Is there any any possibility that some of that $28 million or a subsequent federal program could be used for wage subsidies or operating costs to allow the government, uh, the provincial government, not to shoulder the entire burden, the financial burden of, of keeping these people employed in this sector? The $28 million fund um that is outside of my area of um, negotiations. I, I do know from discussions with the potato board and the department that $28 million certainly doesn't go far enough when you look at what they're facing on, you know, everyone is very pleased with the transfer of product to food banks because we farmers and everyone want product to go to feed people. Um, I think the, I had mentioned to one of the other questions, I was around in 2000 on the destruction piece. Um, I, you know, our approach provincially would be that money isn't going to go far enough in what it's been targeted to do. Um, in, in 2000, we do feel that the province received additional federal support on wages to help offset potato ward situations. And we've been we have written to the federal minister and, and will continue to engage with our, our federal colleagues on, you know, we need flexibility to respond. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really, the background I have isn't in the discussions around that 28 million, but I do know from the relationship that I have with the packing companies and, and, and producers that it's not enough. And if we did try to carve out a portion of negotiations for wage support, it's just taking a small pie and making it smaller. So we'll continue on our route with um, trying to get more wage support. Okay. Peter? 
Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mary, for that. And I absolutely agree. It, as you put it very eloquently, it's taking a small fine, making it even smaller if we start using it for other purposes, uh, which is why we need to um, engage federal support in order to keep these people employed uh, in this sector. The two programs that run through your department, Mary, which would be the financing program and the wage subsidy program, I understand why um, those were the focus of your presentation today. But the Emergency Contingency Fund, which is also a provincial program, um, has several elements to it, which it strikes me would have relevance for your department. Um, for example, exploring new market developments and accessing additional supports for markets that may have been lost and strategy development. And I'm wondering if your department has, ha has played any role in getting that $10 million from the Emergency Contingency Fund out the door. Yes, our department would be engaged. Me personally, no. I think I, you know, our plate has been full on the workforce development side and with the potato export program. So it would be colleagues within the department working with our deputy minister and others on that element. Um, but I'm, I'm focused in on the workforce and the training component side. Peter? I think those are all the questions I had, Chair. I, I really appreciate you being here, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Do we have any uh, any more questions from any? No? Okay, well, thank you very much, Mary, for your time this morning. We appreciate you coming in and answering uh, our questions and uh, very, uh, very good answers as well and very thoughtful, so. Um, Mary, if you could just, you can exit the meeting now and then we can just continue on with our agenda. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, we have new business. I don't know, if, Clerk, if we want to go over our schedule for the next, just to kind of for the record, I guess. Um, so we have a meeting with... Um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency um, next week. Um, and they are going to... No. I apologize. And they said they could, she it could or he could only do an hour. Yes, it's only going to be an hour, and there actually is, and that's what I'm just looking for now, an additional um, guest appearing. So, yes, it's Thursday at 10. Um, so the Chief Plant Health Officer, um, David Bailey, he was there previously at the uh, other meeting. He's returning um, with um, Vice President Sylvia LaPointe. So we had previously decided to have her in, and then she thought that he might help answer any okay. other questions. Okay. from that side and um, they and won't have a presentation right no it's just okay. questions um and answers and then we'll have the um pi federation of agriculture back in um on the topic on the following week at 10 a.m and then Perfect. that brings us to the planning week so that's all of the meetings so far i don't know okay. if there's any new business but it might have to happen either on a irregular time or once we come back Okay, perfect. So just, uh, I guess, a reminder to the members then that next week to have, um, we only have an hour, and just to have our questions ready, because as soon as 10 o'clock starts, we'll just, we're going to jump right into questions. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, do we have any new business? No? Okay. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Darlene.